Okay, well, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for attending this afternoon's breakout session. I'm Carol Hagens. I am a scientific and health communications consultant at ODS. And we've got a great session this afternoon um, that I think will highlight a lot of useful dietary supplement research databases and resources. They can be helpful whether you are a researcher, a healthcare provider, an educator, a member of industry, or involved with regulatory matters, or just someone who has an interest in dietary supplements and wants to learn how and where to find out more. Um, we'll have three speakers, and after each presentation, we'll have time to answer your questions. So just to, as a reminder, please submit your questions for presenters in the chat box. Like yesterday, I don't believe we have a separate Q&A box, so just go ahead and put them in the chat box, um, and I'll get to as many as we can after each presentation. Um, I'm going to very briefly introduce each speaker, but um, please go to the Practicum website to see their detailed bios and the agenda for more information. So to start, I'd like to welcome our first speaker, Joyce Merkel. She is a science and health communications research analyst at ODS, where she works on dietary supplement literature databases and searches and in communication and promotion activities. Ms. Merkel manages the ODS social media platforms, which includes Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and she creates and updates ODS website material. Um, she also responds to consumer questions that we receive through uh, the Ask ODS portal. So please welcome Ms. Merkel. She'll be talking about dietary supplement databases. Thank you. Thanks, Carol. Good afternoon. Um, my disclosure, um, I have been a contractor with ODS for 15 years now. I'm sitting just outside Boston, which is wonderful. Um, the views expressed today are my own and not of my contracting agency or of NIH, and I have no disclosures or conflicts of interest to disclose. And I, other than that, I am thrilled to have been doing this job working in literature and databases and with social media and technology, combining it with my nutrition background. It has been a wonderful uh, career so far. So for the next 30 minutes, I would like to introduce or remind you of some wonderful databases and resources for dietary supplements that hopefully, as Carol said, will be useful for researchers and communicators and educators and practitioners and just anybody. I know as when I was a professor, I, I loved using some of these materials. So they're, they're great for many people. So let's get started. What we're going to do today, we're going to cover several different areas, including bibliographic research literature, uh, where you can also find current and ongoing research and dietary supplements and trials. We're going to look at databases that are available on nutrients, ingredients, methods, um, and labels. And then we're going to go uh, just briefly into the wealth of information and resources for things like fact sheets and monographs and evidence reports, things that pull together all the previous information into nice documents and resources for use. And then the very last thing, just a little bit about alerts on how to get some of this information directly to your email so you don't even have to go looking for it. So first of all, I want to start with some bibliographic uh, literature databases. There are many databases. If you have a library available to you, you know there's many, but I just want to hit on three of them today and some features of each. PubMed, Medline, I'm sure anybody working in science has definitely used this. Uh, Agricola from USDA and also Agris, an international one I'll touch on as well. There are multiple databases, multiple strategies, uh, strategies being the search terms that you use um, or the strings, trying to find what you want without getting everything that's unrelated and yet being specific enough to get things that you want on target, but not miss things. So searching the literature really is an art. You know, it's called library science, but it, but it really is an art. And again, multiple databases, multiple strategies to get what you want. So a little bit about um, the NCBI, the National Center for Biotechnology and Information, has 
many, many products, including PubMed, Medline, and a few others that I want to point out, but it has many, many resources. So I would recommend taking a look at NCBI. It has ToxNet, it has genetic information, it has uh, chemistry databases. So more than just, just the PubMed that we're all familiar with. So PubMed and Medline, they're said synonymously a lot of the time, but they are a little different. Now, if you're searching PubMed, you're looking at more than over 35 million citations at this point. Um, it is basically the published literature, much of it peer reviewed, some of it not peer reviewed. So it's, it's got a variety. Medline is a little bit smaller than PubMed. Medline is articles drawn from specific journals that they have deemed and accepted. And those articles that they've drawn from the journals have been then indexed with something they call medical subject headings, which are basically like a controlled vocabulary or a defined term. And then they're also curated. There's only 29 million references currently in Medline. So those are the, the when you search PubMed, you're basically searching both of them, but you could just search Medline for those that are indexed. A couple of other things I, I wanna, mention our PubMed Central. So a lot of times if you go to just PubMed and you click on a great article and you see where you can link to it, but oh shoot, you don't have full text. You don't have a subscription or the library you're at doesn't have that journal. You can't access the full article without uh, buying it. So PubMed Central is a place where there is full text archived of many, many journal articles. So if you're looking for something, um, check out PubMed Central. You may actually find the full text article without having to go to the actual journal website for it. The other thing that PubMed or NCBI has is a bookshelf where it archives a variety of books and reports and databases and other documents. Um, particularly useful I find here is the dietary reference intakes. You can find those documents there. However, you can get them from the National Academies as well but this is also a great place. And I'm gonna show you one resource in the bookshelf that I think is useful in the uh, dietary supplement realm. Now, searching these things, um, it, it can be a lot on your own. Um, it is, there are lots of helps within NCBI on how to use the different databases, search techniques. You also can contact the National Library of Medicine reference librarians if you need some help which is a great service. I mean, that's what librarians are for. They're, they're, they're meant to help you. Um, searching PubMed, just a couple of things that have changed over the last few years. It used to be something called limits and now they're called filters where you can limit your search or your search strategy and your terms with a variety of, of different categories. And the reason I'm just pointing this out is because it's changed. We used to be able to sub to narrow our search by subjects. And ODS actually had a dietary supplement uh, filter for dietary supplements. It was a search strategy that if you selected it, it would narrow all those 35 million citations down to those that um, match the, the strategy that we provided to NLM that we updated and worked on each year. However, that as well as the complementary subject filter are, are no longer. In fact, there are no subject filters anymore. So what do you use if you're really trying to search for dietary supplement research in PubMed? You're probably familiar with something called MESH or the medical subject headings. And this is basically the defined or the controlled vocabulary that when indexers at the National Library of Medicine are indexing an article um, in Medline, they can, if that article pertains to the subject, they can add this mesh. So then when you use this mesh or this term in your search, it pulls out all those articles that have been indexed. Dietary supplements is actually a mesh term and has been since 1998. There are also other mesh terms you can use, um, herbal medicine, probiotics, those types of things. And every individual nutrient and many substances such as acai, black cohosh, ginkgo, there are also mesh terms for those. So those help you get at uh, a better, stronger search by using mesh terms. And again, there's lots of helps um, available at NCBI um, on how to use the mesh. 
but makes it makes it great. So if you haven't remembered or haven't used mesh lately, take a look at it again. It's very useful. This one feature I saw in NCBI looked very interesting. It's called PubMed Clinical Queries, where they actually have applied filters and searches that you can then just put in a search term and it will pull out related articles. This is more in clinical. So if you're looking at what type of research may be done in a clinical realm or disease realm with something like ginkgo or black cohosh, this is a way to narrow it. Um, in different categories, if you want therapy or diagnosis or etiology, um, and you can get it broad or you can get it narrow. Um, but play around with it because I, I put in a couple of different uh, herbals and I, it did bring up articles that, that then takes you to PubMed where you can look at those articles and do more with them. But it's a, a nice feature. Something in the bookshelf, and it, it, this is a database, but it's in the bookshelf and it's called Drugs and Lactation Database or LactMed. And it has uh, a ton of drugs and chemicals that have some relation or have been looked at or have some research related to breastfeeding. Um, adverse effects, if any, um, the effect on the blood and the infant, it all comes from the literature. They're all fully referenced peer, um, and, and um, reviewed by a panel. And they are, are fairly updated. Um, and it does, if you look at the list, let me pull this one up. Come on, here we go. There we go. It's a book, but if you can you can scroll down and just see this very, 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 let me make it a little larger for you. Very, very long list of different uh, substances. But if we were to just go into the box, if we were to put, if we put ginkgo, and it finds it, and it shows you a, a, a selection from this book, drug levels, effects in breast infants, you know, not, not a lot of uh, information was not found, some references. So it's a place to look if this happens to be your interest in, in lactation and, um, and mothers. And this isn't just one of the book references or one of the book resources in NCBI. Let's go on. So those are just a couple of features, but I would encourage you to take a look at NCBI and see everything that, that it does offer you. Again, multiple databases, multiple strategies to find what you might be looking for. This, also, this new, this is relatively new. I'm not sure how long it's been around, but um, the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health used to have one of the subject filters for complementary medicine, and that has gone away. Now they have actually pre-formatted strategy, pre-formatted strategies using filters and then a variety of, of different topics. It's not only just dietary supplements and dietary supplement ingredients, but there's also um, all the other complementary um, health and medicine type things, um, acupuncture, tai chi, uh, yoga, those things as well. But what they've done, let me show you this, they have created a search strategy for you and hooked it up with PubMed so that when you click on it, it pulls in all the articles that fit that particular criteria. You can do systematic reviews, meta-analyses, or RCTs, randomized controlled trials, or herb-drug interactions. So let's take a look at this. This takes you to, come on, This takes you to NCCIH's website, and you can see that there is a very, very, very long list of substances. So if I scroll down, I think I looked at black cohosh. So you can see black cohosh, you know, common dietary supplement, systematic reviews, herb drug interactions, RCT. So let's click on the RCTs. What it does, it takes you right to NLM to PubMed, and it shows you the different articles that fit that search. And it gives you a little bit here of what the actual search is. But if you really want to see what you're searching, you go to advanced. Let's see if I make this a little bit bigger yet. Okay. 
You go to advanced and it's this one here, the first one. So I'm gonna look at details. And you can see this is the actual search string that is being applied when you click that. And you can see that it has the five-year filter. So for example, if you wanna change it to 10 years, you could take this whole thing, change it and pop it into PubMed and get a different set of results. But you can actually see that it's doing the randomized control, the humans and the English. So this is a, a great, great service by NCCIH. Let's go back. This is called Evidence-Based Medicine Literature Reviews. It can get you started with a search string for many different substances. Okay, let's move on. So those were just a few things with NCBI, but as I said, there's many good features there. USDA provides a literature database called Agricola, Agricultural Online access. Now, you may think this is just agriculture. However, USDA is also food and nutrition. And when you think about plant sciences, you also think about the growing of herbal type products. So you can actually find quite a bit in Agricola, um, depending on your subject that you're looking for. It doesn't um, have a lot of links to full text, but in, it does include abstracts in many cases. And what's great is that the Agricola library, the USDA has records going back um, quite far. Um, it has some wonderful prints of botanicals all the way back to the 15th century actually housed at their library. Um, they're, they're gorgeous. Anyway, I digress, but I used to work there. So, so that's the USDA bibliographic uh, literature database. It has a nice interface. The third database I want to talk about is Agris, and this is an international one by FAO of the United Food Net, um, and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Free, open to the public. It covers the agriculture, the um, aquatic fisheries, but it also covers human nutrition and extension literature. And it draws from many institutions um, from 65 countries. Has over 14 million records, which is still quite a bit. Um, 82% from scientific journals, lots of different languages. It also has data sets that you could use um, if you're looking for specific data to work with. What I like about Agris is that it has gray literature, such as things that might not be published like theses or conference papers um, and some of the data sets and government publications that you might not find in PubMed or Medline. So Agris is also a, a good one to check. Okay, going on. Uh, final thing, you know, if you want to cast a really, really wide net just to start, throw it in Google Scholar and see what you get. Maybe you can get a direction. It's just a really simple way to broadly search and you can, you can limit it by years and, and a variety of things. So it's worth a look. If, again, multiple strategies, multiple databases. Biomedical and nutrition, um, databases about what's actually going on. Where's the research being done now that may not be published in an article yet? There are some places that you can look. And we're going to look at four of them quickly. Who's doing the research? Who's funding it? What does it entail? What's the time frame? These are online and accessible to the public. NIH records and research activities are in the NIH reporter. It also includes CDC and the Agency for Healthcare Research, ARC, um, HRSA. It also has some VA. It goes all the way back to 1972 and it's updated every week. So it's NIH Research Plus. It has a nice interface as well. Not too difficult to search. So Reporter is all NIH research. So anything from HIV to children to uh, COVID, not specifically dietary supplements, although you can find dietary supplement research in there. But CARDS, the computer access to research on dietary supplements is a database, a federally funded dietary supplement research. And it's part of our Office of Dietary Supplement mandate to maintain a database of scientific research. So if you want just dietary supplement research that has been conducted or is ongoing, this is the place to go. 
And you can get all the usual information, abstract ingredients, health outcomes, the research methodology. And it goes back to 1999. So can narrow down just to supplement research and it has a nice interface. If you have questions about cards, you can always contact our office. Clinicaltrials.gov, if you're looking for research that's going on with clinical trials or human trials, <clears throat> clinical trials is a registry and results database, both federally and privately supported clinical trials, US and worldwide. Right now it has over 450,000 trials of which over 80,000 are currently recruiting. So in 20, 221 countries. What's nice about this is that you can search by topic of dietary supplement. Let me go here. So this is the, this is the current version of clinicaltrials.gov. And if you scroll down, you can studies by topic. You can, you can put in your regular dietary supplement if you wanna search by the term, say ginkgo or black cohosh or whatever, but you can also go studies by topic and dietary supplements alphabetical. And you can scroll down and you can see the number of studies for each of the different um, supplements or supplement ingredients. This was a list that ODS worked with clinicaltrials.gov to, um, to implement. Now, Clinical trials has a beta version. And from what I can find, I cannot find this topic list in beta version. So you will be forced to search by the name or the type or the ingredient. However, clinical trials is still a great resource to see what's being done. So if you wanna see what kind of ginkgo research is going on right now, or has in, in uh, the process or has just completed before it's actually been published, you can take a look with clinicaltrials.gov, it's a good resource. CRIS, the current research information system is the USDA product like NIH reporter. And it's a, a record and documentation of all the ongoing um, research in USDA and in NEFA. Now, it of course is lots of agricultural, but there is also nutrition and um, some of those types of research as well. So it's another place to search for what type of research is currently going on. Okay, so those were places where you can find ongoing research or research that's just getting started or just finished before it actually hits the published literature. So a few databases that provide nutrient, ingredient, methods, or labels, um, not necessarily literature. I'm gonna talk quickly about analytical methods and reference materials. You just uh, probably heard Dr. Kuzek talk about his program. There's a database there. Food Data Central is what used to be the food composition database um, that we've all probably used. And the DSID, the Dietary Supplement Ingredient Database, you'll hear more from Karen coming up, as well as the Dietary Supplement Label Database, um, which you'll also hear more later in this, this breakout session. So the Analytical Methods and Reference Materials Database, if you go to that website, there's a database of articles and reports that relate to the development of analytical methods or reference materials. We've broken it into categories, including adulterants, botanical authenticity, different method development reports, NIST reference material reports. So while these articles are also published other places like PubMed or Medline, this pulls them out and gives you um, a little less uh, volume to actually search through. So that is that the website, the AMRAM website, the simple search box. Okay. Food Data Central is the food composition database provided um, and maintained by USDA, the Nutrient Data Laboratory. Um, what we used to have was just a standard reference um, for food composition, but now Food Data Central incorporates a whole lot more of other categories. So it, it's much more robust. And if you're looking for nutrient content of foods, as well as 
Um, and you think, how does that apply to dietary supplements? Well, there's fortified foods and there are actually some things like energy drinks and those types of things in this database. So it still might be very useful. USDA and with the support of ODS also has some special component databases. And we have just compiled those into a, a web page at ODS where you can find them. Uh, choline, fluoride, iodine, and purines. And some of these are fairly small databases, but they have a, a unique niche. So with the concern that iodine might be low in some populations in the United States, there wasn't a lot of good information about iodine and foods. So now we are in a third iteration of iodine and foods, and this has actually been measured and um, put into a database. Um, they are now also working on a purine database, which is in its initial, but um, that is concerned with people with gout. So um, this is a newer feature and, and can be useful for select groups of, of the population, select researchers, free and, free and open to the public though. The Dietary Supplement Ingredient Database, I'm not going to say a lot about this because our next speaker, Karen Andrews, will um, go about go over it. But, but, but basically what they have done, if you don't happen to catch her talk, is they, they pulled products off the shelves and actually chemically analyzed them with standardized methods. And this isn't necessarily for your consumer to go and look at and say, okay, does my multivitamin have what it says on the label? This is more for researchers who are trying to estimate the US population. You can't go to this and just pull off a specific brand, but you can get an idea of, of uh, consolidated uh, amounts and, and does it does it generally have what's on the label, you know, at the beginning or at the end of its expiration. So they've worked with multivitamins and they've done some prenatals, omega-3s, and they've been working on some green tea. It's public domain, copyright free, and it is accessible. So um, take a listen to Karen coming up about uh, the DSID. <clears throat> All right, so we have Superman here. Zinc, iron, copper, selenium, phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, kryptonite. Uh-oh. Labels are really important. They will tell you what's in things that you might not want. The Dietary Supplement Label Database is also a project of the Office of Dietary Supplements. Again, another commercial, but um, lots of good resources from our office. It contains the full label contents of a sampling of dietary supplements in the U.S. And it's not every single supplement, but it has over 165,000 labels. Um, I checked at the end of last week, so I'm sure it's up now. But and they're either on off on market or off market. So if, as we keep up with that, they can be searched by ingredient or by brand name or type or label statements or manufactured. And it includes a picture of the label. So again, this one, I'm not going to give you a lot more information because the speaker after Karen on the DSID, um, Dr. Leela Saldana is going to talk about um, the D going to talk about the dietary supplement label database and give you a lot more information on that, but it's a, it's a really good uh, resource. Now, caveat is that these are not analyzed or vetted or um, recommended by our office. They are just the labels that have been put into a database. So, but it's good to compare. It's good if you're looking what's in a specific product, if you're a practitioner and you're Patient says, I'm taking this. Well, what's in it? I don't know. You could look it up and actually see um, what's in it. So there's also one other uh, dietary supplement label database that is um, in the public sector. And this is called the Supplement OWL. And it was created in 2017 by the Council for Responsible Nutrition or CRN. And this is um, one that you can also take a look at, but it's, it's an industry-wide uh, project registry um, and similar to the DSLD and it, can, it has similar information um, off the labels. You can search it, sort it, look at the labels. Right now it has, I believe over 11,000 products. 
Um, tomorrow, one of your speakers will be Dr. or Mr. Stephen Mister, who works with, who is CRN. So if you have more questions or he may um, actually talk about Supplement Owl a little bit so you can um, find out more then. But again, it's, it's another label database that's available. Okay, um, I have a couple of articles in a reference list that's attached to my uh, name on the agenda, um, but there's some lots of botanical databases out there, both international, and there is one particular article, and it's one of its supplemental tables that has an amazing compilation of botanical databases that you might want to check out. Last things I want to talk about. And these are not databases, but these are just all kinds of other resources available to you that actually takes the information from databases and literature and puts them together um, in all kinds of different forms. So um, all of these things are on an optional reading list that's on the agenda. And there are many, 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 as you can see, lots of these are all resources just open to you. So I can't possibly go through all of these, but I'm gonna hit just a couple of them. Again, ODS, one of our, our great products is the dietary supplement fact sheets. These are evidence-based, updated regularly. They cover all the vitamins and minerals that have dietary reference intakes for them, as well as some herbals and botanicals and some special ones like uh, glucosamine, chondroitin. We also have some that are um, combinations. So for weight loss or exercise and athletic performance, what types of uh, supplements actually um, are used for that? And then all of those are reviewed in a fact sheet. We have health professional version, uh, which is fully referenced with the links to PubMed for each reference, uh, consumer, and then our consumer version is also in Spanish. Just to show you, if you click into one, it's pretty easy to get each of the, the features. We also then um, pull in from other sources. Let's see, I'll pull another one. Let's go to Ginkgo. Ginkgo is my fallback. So we don't have our own fact sheet on Ginkgo, but for Ginkgo, the NCCIH has one. So we include more than just what we've created. So there's, there's a long list of, of great resources for lots of different dietary supplements and ingredients. Natural Medicines Database, you've probably heard of. This is a subscription. It merged a few years ago with something called Natural Standard. But if you're looking for monographs, or background information on a variety of, of supplements, this does make a good reference. And if you are um, in an organization or uh, a library that has access to it, it's another good one to check out. Interestingly, Canada has a little different system with uh, regulating its dietary supplements and uh, natural or health products. Um, somebody mentioned it earlier this morning that they do have wonderful monographs. So anything that's approved or cleared in Canada, there has to be a background information. So basically it's like our fact sheets, they're fully referenced with all the background information. And these are free and open um, on their websites as well. So again, if you're looking for something, uh, um, reference document on a particular ingredient. This is a good place to check out as well. This is a little different, but it's it's not been around that terribly long. The FDA does have a, a database of tainted products. Um, so it's also a good one to check out from things that they have been reported and they have investigated as being adulterated or um, potentially harmful. And it's not, not comprehensive. Um, it's only, they say it's only a small fraction of the potentially hazardous products, um, but it's a start and it might be a good place to check a specific ingredient or a specific brand. Okay, so I can only, only talk briefly about these. I am like out of time, but uh, I do also want to point out one more, the NCCIH herbs at a glance. Our office doesn't do a lot of fact sheets on herbs, but NCCIH has a lot of good resources 
on herbs as well as other dietary supplements. So definitely check out the reading list that I provided to you. Or if you have questions, you know, feel free to contact me or contact us. Last thing. So all those things are out there that you can go look for, but how would you like them to come to you? There's a couple of alerts that I look, I use that are particularly useful. You can do Google alerts where you've done a Google search. You can turn it into alert and tell it to come. So I want, I want everything that has anything to do with uh, ashwagandha um, to come to me once a week and it will appear in your email. The same with NCBI. If you do, if you create a really great search string and you want to see what gets updated with it, you can also program that so that it comes once a week, comes every day, comes once a month. It will then go out and run that search that you created in PubMed and Medline and send you the results. I have quite a number of those set up. So every Monday I get... Uh, on NCBI saved searches for uh, vitamin D in dietary supplements or vitamin D in a particular disease. So Google Alerts look like this. It scans through everything and sends you an email and you can just click into, sorry, click into the topic and see if it's anything that is of interest, but it can be in anything. It's not just literature, it's not just in science. It can be the New York Times. The NCBI looks a little different. It shows you the search string that it's searching and then it gives you any results if there are any. This was one that I had have programmed for um, arginine and the military because we were looking at war fighters and the use of arginine supplements. So it comes about once a week, um, doesn't always have a lot, but I, I know that it's keeping up on the science. And Okay, sorry, I have run through a lot of resources really fast. I know there's lots of them, others out there, but I hope that there's at least one in there that's new or that will give you something or that reminds you that, oh yeah, I knew about that. I need to look at that again. Um, reminder, our website has a lot of great information, all the different programs, all the fact sheets. Um, check out my reading and resources list for more information. If you're looking for something and you just can't find it, or you have questions, you can always email us um, or you can email me directly and I'll be happy to try to help. Also, if you want pushed information to you, uh, scan our QR code and you can sign up for our different electronic newsletters. The scoop is more for consumers, although it's good for practitioners and um, educators to see something maybe you could use with your clients or patients or students. Um, ODS updates is more for the professional, but you could sign up for them all. They, they don't overwhelm your mailbox. We don't, we don't send them out every week, uh, probably like every quarter. Also, we are on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. That's where we post every weekday for the most part with our newer resources, including like we just came out with a, a carnitine consumer fact sheet, and we will be um, highlighting our consumer Spanish um, carnitine fact sheet, but we post them uh, generally first on our, our social media. So it's another way to keep up and keep information coming to you without you having to go look for it. And I thank you for listening. And I hope, as I said, you have gotten at least one new idea where you can find great resources on dietary supplements. And if you have any questions, I can try to try to help. Okay, yes, thank you, Joyce. That's a really, a lot of really useful information and resources, I think even for seasoned researchers. So thank you very much. Um, as a reminder to attendees, please put your questions in the chat. I see some there, so we'll get started and I'll, we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, so the first question, um, I think it per, uh, pertains to the ODS dietary supplement fact sheet. Uh, there's two questions. What, what defines updated regularly what interval is considered regular? And does ODS take public feedback when the fact sheets are inaccurate or not modern when updating each fact sheet? I can address some of that. However, I'm not the fact sheet team and Carol actually is, but I can tell you when we get questions from a consumer or from a professional into our Ask ODS pointing out something that would be good to add to the fact sheet, 
it goes to the fact sheet team, they review it and we, we have um, any number of times changed our fact sheet to incorporate the suggestion or the, the change. Um, Carol, you can talk more about the regularly updated, um, but I know when new literature when new literature comes out, if it's important and if it has a bulk of the evidence, it gets changed. Yes, I'd be happy to. Uh, yeah, I I, uh, I second uh, Joyce's comment. We do take um, every comment we receive seriously. Obviously, we you know check with the scientific literature since everything we we change or add to our fact sheets is based on the on the literature. But we always take. Um, comments in, into account and do update the fact sheets regularly. As far as the, the regular, you know, re full review, that kind of thing, we get to them as often as we can, um, you know, with the, the, the team that we have. When a major new study comes out, like the VITAL trial or, uh, I mean, you know, the strength trial, uh, those kinds of things, you know, one of those uh, trials on omega-3s that, that Joe Betts discussed this morning, um, we, almost immediately do update the fact sheets with those kinds of new materials. Um, but then we try to also do sort of a regular update of the entire thing as, as often as we can. Okay, so another question, um, does the ODS align with the FDA on vitamin conversion, for example, vitamin A? Yes, the, the fact sheets align with whatever, you know, there is a lot of confusion right now with some of the the conversion factors and the changing from uh, micrograms or international units and different things. But yes, we agree with that as well as whatever the dietary reference intakes and the, the fact sheets again, represent the science and what's, what's documented. Correct, Carol, I know we've gotten lots of comments on that recently. Yeah, exactly. But vitamin uh, nutrient conversions are, are an ongoing uh, question. Um, and they are they are going away now that IUs have been eliminated. You know we're all in micrograms or milligrams, but they still do crop up from time to time. Vitamin D is still labeled in both micrograms and IUs. But yes, absolutely everything we we have aligns with FDA, and in fact links to a lot of those um, you know the references that they provide as well. Okay, I think there was another question on the the list the um, adulterated the FDA's adulterated dietary supplement listing, um, a comment that they may have missed some products. I don't know if that's something that Joyce that you can comment on, but uh, it, mm. okay. No, yeah. FDA specifically says that it, it can't, it doesn't have everything on there, but it's, it's a starting, it's an attempt. But yeah, if you go, we, we have no way of, of assisting FDA with that. They get all the adverse events results or uh, reports and they do the investigations. We have no regulatory um, capability or responsibility there. Uh, just pointed out as a reference, but again, it's, it's um, they admit that it's not complete. Okay, great. Uh, uh, kudos, uh, awesome presentation was one comment. I think a lot of people are feeling that way. Um, great to see our tax dollars being used for outstanding information. Um, okay, another one. Uh, will ODS interact with the public on social media or um, on posts, um, but does not seem to engage with consumers and readers of your posts? I'm not sure if that's one you can uh, comment on either, but Joyce, you do, you do handle our, um, our social media, so maybe you have some thoughts on that. We do have a monitoring system where we do try to catch posts and comments on our social media. Um, when we do find them, we share them with our communications team to determine our best action. In many cases, if there's a question, um, we try to, if it's not a simple response that won't take paragraphs, we tell them to please contact us at ODS. Um, ask ODS, and we will respond to them at, in a day or two. We're pretty quick about it. Both Carol and I are um, doing lots of responses quite quite quickly. Um, if it's snarky comments or things that are, well, if there's snarky comments or if there's not really a question, we tend not to engage because we also understand how social media can blow up and it can cause a, a cascade of, of negativity that, um, you know, if it, if it doesn't require response, we don't tend to respond. As many NIH and 
institutes and offices also um, do the same. They, they don't engage necessarily. Um, in some cases, we will, will like a comment or like a tweet. Um, and in some cases, we do respond. Um, but again, each one is, is put to the communications team and we determine um, our office response for that. Okay, great. Looks like we're out of time, but um, thank you very much, Joyce, for a fantastic Welcome. presentation and um, we'll move on. I believe there is one more question in the chat, Joyce, if you'd like to, to comment on that, perhaps in writing, um, but otherwise I think we're able to get to everything. Okay. Uh, yes. so, yeah, I see it. Yep. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Joyce. Um, so our next speaker is Karen Andrews. Um, she is with the Methods and Application of Food Composition Laboratory at the Beltsville Human Nutrition Research Center at U USDA. Um, Ms. Andrews initiated the research program for the Dietary Supplement Ingredient Database, also called the DSID that, that uh, Joyce Merkel mentioned briefly in 2003, and that was in partnership with ODS. Um, the DSID is an analytically validated database of dietary supplement ingredient information, and she now manages a research team for the DSID. And the title of her talk is Dietary Supplement Ingredient Database. So please welcome Ms. Andrews. Thank you. Alicia or James, I don't see a, a um, the recording running. Are you working on getting that up? Great, thank you. Is it, uh, are you seeing my screen? Black right now, probably? Yes, yes seeing your screen in black. Yep. All right. I, I think it's working. Let me uh, run it. Uh, I'm going to start from the top. Hi. Um, I'm here to talk about the Dietary Supplement Ingredient Database. James, are you still there? I don't, we still see a blank screen. It started for a second and then cut out. I am not, uh, it's just playing. Uh, I'm not sure why it would be cutting out. Let's start and stop sharing again. Hi, um, I'm here to talk about the Dietary Supplement Ingredient Database. Thank you for the invitation to talk about this at the practicum. Today, I'll be describing the DSID, and I will be talking about the nationally representative multivitamin and mineral studies and some of the results from those studies. I'll be talking about how the DSID data, DSID data can be applied. I'll be talking about some botanical studies that we've done I'll be letting you know about disintegration and dissolution testing of dietary supplement dosage forms and just a brief discussion of our current studies. The Dietary Supplement Ingredient Database project was begun about 20 years ago with a major goal to provide nationally representative ingredient estimates and variability 
based on chemical analysis for popular categories of dietary supplements. More recently, we've added the second goal, which is to, to, to look at the performance quality testing for dietary supplements. The DSID is needed because many dietary supplements contain high levels of nutrients and bioactives. They contain higher levels than you would find in foods or in herbal botanicals. And these labels may not reflect the analytical content. And when um, intake calculations are done in order to look at health and diet relationships, um, the label level may not be accurate. And so these mean estimates of analytical content can be applied to improve those calculations. So I'm going to briefly discuss the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey because it is integral to the Dietary Supplement Ingredient Database work. It's a continuous survey of about 2,500 people a year in the U.S. where um, they are interviewed and physical exams are completed. And the people are asked, you know, what food did you eat in the last 24 hours to try and get a good assessment of their intake. And more recently, they've been asking in these interviews, what supplements did you take in the last 24 hours or in the past 30 days? And the DSID project is here to answer the question, how accurately do those labels reflect the content? And so we started looking at uh, multivitamin and mineral products because those are the most commonly reported dietary supplements. And these, these pie charts represent the first three studies that we did for this project. We purchased products at mass market retail stores like Walmart and um, grocery stores and Costco. We purchased them at natural specialty retail stores like Whole Foods and GNC. And we also purchased direct products, which we define direct products as exclusively sold online or through um, a health practitioner or a direct marketing company. We do national samplings for our multivitamin and mineral, omega-3, and calcium dietary supplements. We identify products using NHANES information, using the dietary supplement label database information, and other sources. And then we purchase representative samples in six different regions in the US. And I want to mention here that in these studies, we, we defined multivitamin and mineral as containing three or more vitamins with or without minerals and other ingredients. And we have since changed our definition because in, the, in originally we had we combined multivitamins and multivitamin minerals into one category. And more recently, people are separating those products. And so in order to harmonize with other researchers and with the dietary supplement label database, we are now redefining multivitamin and minerals as containing three or more vitamins with at least one mineral and they may have other ingredients as well. And so we will be, for the next release of our DSID, adjusting our data sets and redoing our statistics to take out the five to 10% of products that were just multivitamins only. So once we've identified and purchased supplements for our studies, we send them to laboratories for testing. We've pre-qualified these laboratories with um, USDA uh, laboratory contracts. And when we send the samples to the labs, we put quality control samples in each batch. So we add to each batch at least one blind duplicate product to check, check for uh, consistency of the data from the lab. We put in at least one certified reference material with a known value to check accuracy. And we do in-house controls to test um, the same product over time to look for accuracy and precision over time. We assess the quality control results. We evaluate the product results. If we have questions, we retest the data. When we have the final laboratory data for the study, we compare the lab results to the label levels and we calculate percent difference from label. So now I'm going to show you some data from our studies. So we had 69 dietary supplements that contain calcium in our non-prescription -pres prenatal MBM study. And the um, what we're, we're plotted here is one bar for every supplement in the study, and the left axis represents the percent difference from label. So the products in the study range from about 50% above label to about 50% below label. And so most of the products were within the recommended United States pharmacopoeia limits for 
um, calcium in multivitamin tablets and capsules. That, that's supposed to be between 25% above label to 10% below label. And when we take the same data and we look at it by regression across labeled levels, we get a graph that looks like this, where the calcium in these products ranged from, when you look at the bottom axis, 30 milligrams to 1300 milligrams. And the percent difference from label is again on the left side of the graph. You can see there's a linear relationship here where the products with less calcium tended to be higher than level, higher above level than those products that were um, labeled very high in calcium. They actually got slightly below label by the time we get to 1300 milligrams per serving. So now let's look at one other ingredient. Here's our distribution of results for vitamin D in non-prescription prenatal multivitamins. And you can see that there's a lot more variability here. We have products ranging from 100% above label to 100% below label. And so many more of the dietary supplements were outside of the recommended USP limits, but the limits here are a little bit different. They are 65% above label to minus 10% below label for uh, multivitamins. But we look at the regression analysis for this data, we see a mean model. Um, we have labeled levels ranging from 100 to 1,000 IU. And um, we have um, an average expected above label prediction, actually, of 12.4% above label. And so we've looked at these vitamins and um, some minerals as well in a variety of multivitamin studies. And here's a comparison of, of for the adult MVM studies that we have done. And it's interesting to me that the vitamins here, the for adult multivitamins and for the prescription prenatal, the green and the navy blue, are much more similar to each other than for the non-prescription prenatal multivitamins, which are much closer to labeled levels. And you might think that being closer to labeled levels is actually better, but depending on the distribution of the data, it could mean that half of the data is below label. And for folic acid in prenatal products, that's not really where we want to be for the supplements. Um, for the minerals, calcium, iodine, and iron, we see, we see results pretty close to each other for all three of these MVM studies. And then there's one more factor that we, we like to look at when we look at these, these kinds of data. And here we see the mean percent difference above label. And then we show the most common labeled level. And then, um, and then we've listed here the um, percent of the recommended dietary allowance to show kind of what is the strength of these products at the most common labeled level. And we're seeing 100% or greater of the RDA for most ingredients in the multivitamin products. And so um, from our five studies of vitamins and minerals, we found on average overages for most ingredients. And we saw the highest overages for vitamin A, vitamin D, folic acid, iodine, chromium, and selenium. And as you, you've seen, we see um, analytically measured mean content varies by dietary supplement category and varies among ingredients. And um, the other question we had about variability, uh, for most ingredients, we are seeing the differences are, are from supplement to supplement and not within supplements. So now I'm going to discuss um, briefly some applications of the DSID data. They are really not meant to be applied to individual products. They can be applied to larger data sets to help improve diet and health assessments. So this is a picture of the, of the uh, homepage for our website. And um, we have a calculator section. And in the calculator section, we have um, the regression results for each of our MVM studies and for a couple of other studies. And uh, we have pre-populated it with the, the um, labeled amount per serving that's most common. And the um, and, and it's an interactive calculator. So you can you can there's ability to add in the labeled level you're interested in getting information about. And then this information can be stored 
and it can be downloaded if that's helpful to you for your research. Even better, we have a data files section on our website where we have the actual regression equations for every ingredient in each of these studies, then we have all the parameters needed to calculate what the predictions would be for individual labeled levels. We also have made it easy for people to try to apply this data to NHANES by having all of these different codes with data linked to NHANES. And the way we've set that up is, is a good way to show kind of to, to demonstrate exactly what our regression analyses are really are really showing. And so each of our predictions is based on three factors. So the category type, the ingredient name, and the labeled level for the ingredient. So for this example on this, on this um, um, slide, we've got category three is non-prescription prenatal multivitamins. So non-prescription prenatal multivitamins with vitamin D labeled at 400 IU would be predicted to have actually 449 IU. And that prediction has this linking code. And then the linking code on the, on the right and the linking code on the left um, in this next table is linked to specific NHANES supplement IDs in order to um, to link it to specific products to make it easier for people to apply this data to NHANES or other data sets similar to NHANES. Okay, um, now I'm gonna move on to talk about our DSID Botanical Initiative, which we began about 10 years ago. Um, herbal and botanical dietary supplement use continues to increase, and now it counts for about 20% of dietary supplement sales. Many of the ingredients in herbals and botanicals are also in foods and beverages, and so it is important to track um, their intake. Uh, the FDA labeling regulations for botanicals require the name of the plant genus and the species, the part of the plant, and the weight of the bo total botanical material. Other claims for content are voluntary. And so for our botanical studies, we um, are asking two main questions. How well does the required label information, which is the total weight of botanical material, predict the actual content of bioactives? And this is an important question because um, many botanical uh, dietary supplements have extracts. And these extracts may be um, highly concentrated or they may not be highly concentrated. They also may be um, encapsulated with materials that make them much heavier or else they may be um, actually a, a, a liquid that is spray dried onto a carrier, which adds weight as well. And so the actual weight of the botanic material may, may not be related to the, the phytochemical content. And then the other question we want to answer is, how accurate is any voluntary information about phytochemical content? Um, how accurate is it in the, these, these botanical supplements? So the first um, study was green tea. It's a very popular botanical dietary supplements. People take it for um, its health, the health effects of the catechins, especially epigallocatechin gallate, EGCG, which is the most prominent, predominant um, catechin. And of course, green tea has caffeine naturally occurring as well. We looked at two green tea studies. One had green tea as the only botanical and the primary ingredient, and the other was green tea in a much more complex matrices. And, um, and I wanted to, to demonstrate for you how um, botanical dietary supplements can impact our public health. It, there's a lot of interest in health effects of flavonoids, which are, with catechins are um, included in. And um, a number of studies have looked at what is the mean intake of flavonoids from foods in the United States, and they've estimated between 250 and 700 milligrams per day. So this particular one, this particular green tea supplement would actually add, if the label is correct, 400 milligrams of flavonoids to this to a particular person's intake. So this is significant for our health, um, health um, evaluations. So to show you a little bit of data, this is the 32 products that we tested that were the single ingredient 
green tea products, they the the weight of the green tea ranged from about 200 to about 2000 milligrams per serving. And um, we calculated the amount of, we, 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 we tested for the amount of EGCG and we calculated the percent of EGCG for each of these label claims. And um, we can see, you can see that we see a wide range of percent EGCG and even at the most common labeled level of 500, we see EGCG concentrations ranging from above 60% to zero. And so, and the good news is that 18 of these products had an actual label claim for EGCG. And we do see a good correlation between the analytical and the label claims for EGCG. We've also looked at turmeric dietary supplements and in turmeric supplements, we have um, tested for the three major curcuminoids, curcumin, demethoxycurcumin, and bisdemethoxycurcumin. And um, we summed them together to give total curcumin curcuminoids and have looked at them compared to label because 41 of these products actually had a label claim for total curcuminoids. And so we see a distribution similar to what we see for vitamins and minerals. We see products ranging from about 70% above the label claim to about 40% below label claim, with an average of about 8% above the label claim on the products. One of the most interesting things about turmeric products is that there are standards of identity for turmeric powder and turmeric extract. And so when we took the products in our study and we color coded them here by their self-identified, whether they were turmeric powder extract plus powder or extract, and we plotted them on this 3D scatter plot, we can see some patterns showing up. This, um, this um, black dot with the extra circle around it is a standard reference material, which is a turmeric, um, is a turmeric powder. And so you can see that the three turmeric powders clustered with it appear to follow, follow the same standard of identity. And the same for the other NIST SRM down below with the blue and the green circles, you can see that the um, that these 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 supplements in here uh, all appear to to be turmeric powders or turmeric extracts and turmeric extracts plus powders, but that leaves about nine products outside of these clusters that are suspicious that may be adulterated products. Um, the only thing that we that's likely that we know so about these products is that the, these products that are on the far left are likely to have been um, adulterated with synthetic curcumin uh, because the level of curcumin is much higher than you would find naturally in in a turmeric product and the synthetic curcumin is much cheaper than naturally occurring turmeric. So for these two botanical studies, we, um, we saw similar conclusions. The levels of phytochemicals in these botanical dietary supplements vary widely, even for the same labeled levels. And the um, information about the total weight of the botanical may not predict accurately um, what the actual constituents are for consumers who are trying to buy them or for researchers. And that, um, that we also found that if a product had a voluntary claim for, say, caffeine content or catechin content or curcumin content, that that set of products is actually higher, is likely to be higher in that phytochemical content than those without any kind of voluntary claim at all. Okay, next I'm going to discuss disintegration and dissolution testing of dietary supplements. So um, they, they test how well a a dietary supplement breaks apart and releases its ingredients. So disintegration is really the breaking apart of the physical tablet or capsule. And so that uh, pills are, are placed into water and agitated for half an hour. And at the end of the half hour, um, it passes disintegration if it doesn't have any solid material left. For dissolution, the pills and the capsules are put into liquid and they're agitated for an hour and they pass the test if after an hour, at least 75% of the compound we're tracking is dissolved 
in the solution. So we're looking at two levels of um, releasing of the, making the product available to the body. The United States Pharmacopeia requires this testing for all drugs. Um, the, and the dissolution results are generally better correlated with bioavailability than disintegration results. So we've looked at disintegration testing in a number of studies, and we see this pattern that soft gels are almost always passed. Capsules are less likely to, and tablets even least likely to pass disintegration. And for the prenatal products, we are seeing 60 to 70% for tablets and capsules and 100% for soft gels. Uh, for green tea dietary supplements, we actually see the lowest rates of um, disintegration testing. And then turmeric and cranberry, we see the highest above 80%. We also looked at um, dissolution testing for green tea supplements. And we saw that only about a third of the single ingredient green tea products actually passed dissolution when they were tested for EGCG content. The pass rate was higher for the supplements that had gelatin capsules compared to those in um, cellulose-based capsules. And um, my colleague, Pavel Gusev, published this data in this paper, and this, this um, language in green was in the paper, um, suggesting that this inadequate performance of dosage forms may help to explain variable results in the literature when it comes to the risks and benefits of green tea dietary supplements and that, and recommending that the products used in clinical trials should be tested for disintegration and dissolution um, to be sure that, um, that their, their quality is good in that area. And so one other um, study where we looked carefully at disintegration and dissolution is calcium studies, which is a study we just completed of two to three lots of 102 adult products. And we wanted, we were, we we're interested in testing them because calcium supplements are notoriously known for, for having problems with disintegration and dissolution. And the results are showing that 77% of the products pass disintegration testing, but only 52.3% of them pass dissolution testing. And that, and that products that pass disintegration were equally likely to pass or fail dissolution which means that disintegration testing, which is much less expensive, should not be used as a surrogate for dissolution testing. And here's just a picture of a tablet after at the end of dissolution testing, and you can see that it's practically intact. And that means after being um, agitated in hydrochloric acid for an hour with an RPM of 75 to 100. And the percent dissolved ranged from 10 to 14 percent of the label claims for both calcium and magnesium. And so the, I just wanted to briefly touch on some of our newer studies. We are in the middle of a cranberry dietary supplement study, and they are one of some of the most popular botanical, I think the sixth most popular botanical dietary supplement in the U.S. And we are testing for their content of proanthocyanidins. Um, there is um, a theory that um, it is the specific type A proanthocyanidins or PACs in cranberry that is that are responsible for um, the um, the ability to to stop bacteria from adhering to the the cell walls of urinary tracts. And, and help reduce urinary tract infections. And so that's that's the main reason we're testing for pack content, but we're also testing for identity. Are these cranberry packs? Do they have this type A bond in the packs? And um, are they disintegrating properly? Another study we're just getting underway is looking at methylfolate in dietary supplements. Um, L5 methyl tetrahydrofolate is replacing folic acid in some multivitamin minerals, especially in prenatals, they are being marketed as a more bioavailable form of folic acid, um, but we are concerned about label integrity and content because folic acid is much less expensive than methylfolate, and there's a lot of information about the stability of methylfolate ingredients, but not as much information about their stability in complex matrices with 
other with with um, other with minerals and in products like gummies. And so we're going to be testing for the stability and the content of methylfolate. In conclusion, many dietary supplements contain low high amounts of nutrients and bioactives. Labels may not reflect the actual content um, and that overages are measured in many products. That nutrients and bioactives from supplements should be accounted for in intake calculations. For example, of the adult multivitamin products reported in NHANES 2013-2014, more than 90% are estimated to exceed the label claim by more than 20% for iodine, folic acid, vitamins B12, and D. For botanical dietary supplements, the required information on labels may not provide specific or complete information about bioactive content. And dietary supplements may not release nutrients and bioactives from specific dosage forms. Performance quality is not required to be standardized and monitored for most dietary supplements. Thank you for your attention. I wanted to thank my, my team that works on these projects, Pavel Gusev, Laura O, oh, Josiah E. Kong, Dipesh Pandey, Suma Vavalala, and Kong Shen. And I want to thank Pamela Pearson, who is our the scientific lead for this project. I wanted to thank our, all of our collaborators, especially the Office of Dietary Supplements, who funded this project. Thank you very much. OK. Thank you very much, Karen. Really interesting analyses on a wide range of, of supplements. So thank you for sharing all of those findings. Um, we do have a few questions in the chat box and uh, attendees, please add any more uh, that you might have. Uh, someone commented, nice presentation. Um, so uh, to start off, um, to what extent have the results of your overage regression analyses been translated? into clinical practice and or consumer purchasing change? Yes, um, we, um, the, the thing that came to mind the most for the actually for specifically about the overages is that the um, U United States Pharmacopeia ha actually published an article in their, um, a stimuli article that they, that they do and they have um, concerns that they want to, to be addressed by the community. And um, there, and they used some of our results as um, in the paper to demonstrate their concern about overages of vitamins and minerals, especially if the upper limit, if the you know if the product might be at the upper limit or above that, in order to um, and to to meet the um, shelf life um, standard, at, you know the standard of being above label at the end of shelf life and. What USP was saying in this article is actually that manufacturers should do stability testing. They should do science-based overages so that they know exactly how much over their label claim they need to go and not do extreme overages. Um, and and um, for some of our other uh, dietary supplement research, we do track citations, you know, who has is, who is cited our papers, who has cited our research or our website. And we see a variety of different groups doing it. Um, some of them talking about um, the, the claims, you know, what are the discrepancies between, um, you know, what people um, say that they are eating and what's showing up in their blood levels. That, that some of these overages might explain that. Okay, great. And I think there were a couple of other questions that I think you answered in the chat, but I don't know if you want to add anything else. Um, one of them was, di uh, did all of the samples have the same shelf life when they were tested? And what was the, was the form the same? Gummies, tablets, or a mix? Yeah, I think the shelf life question is really a valid question. Um, and it's an important aspect to talk about. So thanks for bringing that up again. Um, you know, manufacturers do not, you know, do not ever uh, provide the manufacturer date on their products. And so when we pick up these products from the shelf or we order them online, all we see, all we have is our purchase date and then the date of expiration, which, and there's quite a wide range for that. We usually um, purchase products that have at least a year till expiration so that we have time to get all our testing done before the product expires. So that is a little bit of, um, 
you know, I think that our results might be slightly higher than if we bought products that were very close to expiration date, uh, which we we don't because we want to get the testing done in a reasonable in a, in a reasonable time frame. Um, but we are just there are qu enough questions about stability for some of these ingredients that we're actually just beginning a stability study of methylfolate in vitamin supplements. And we are going to be looking at, since again, we don't know the manufacture date, we're going to be looking at products and the methylfolate content and disintegration and dissolution immediately after purchase, halfway between um, the purchase and the expiration date. And again, just before expiration date to see how um, the content and the disintegration and dissolution change over time for those products. And right. I That's should fun. mention too that almost every one of our every one of our studies has a variety of dosage forms. The more dosage forms that we see out there, the more dosage forms we want to have in our study. Okay, great. And I think you also answered this one, but I don't know if you want to add anything else. Do you test for speciation, for example, chromium three or the toxic form chromium six? Um, is there anything you want to add about that? Uh, yeah, that, that's a good question. We do not test for that. Um, the other thing to mention is that that I think, and again, because we are going to be doing this with our new methylfolate study, for example, for vitamin E, we look to the label to say if the label says whether it's a synthetic vitamin E or a natural vitamin E, and then we use that for calculating uh, the label and for our comparison of, of, um, of the actual analytical content to the label. Uh, there is a way to separate and to really um, confirm whether it's natural or synthetic. And we have not been doing that because we, we were informed that there was not a lot of problems with that in the supplement industry, um, for the, especially for the, for the vitamin E. But we are testing that in our methylfolate study. We are actually going to be uh, running these samples on a chiral column to separate the stereoisomers and making sure that we know exactly what form of methylfolate is in that product. Great, okay. So yeah, in terms of the ingredients that you've analyzed, multivitamins, omega-3s, um, you know, mentioned cran and cranberry and methylfolate are on the horizon. How do you prioritize um, those categories and ingredients in terms of what you choose to look at next? Oh yeah, that, yeah, that is something that we've been working with Office of Dietary Supplements in our Dietary Supplement Working Group. Um, over the years. And what we do is we take into account four or five different factors. Number one is what are people taking, right? That's the number one um, part, the one, number one factor in the decision of whether we're going to test for it, right? But the other, the other questions is, you know, how good are the method, how, are they, how good are the analytical methods? So the analytical methods in good shape. And also, is there a standard reference material or a certified reference material that we can use to be sure that our laboratories are giving us accurate results? Okay, great. And finally, um, does the DSID um, have an API for researchers to use or, or how, maybe broader, um, how, you know, what are the methods that if, uh, researchers can use to access the DSID data for their own analyses? Yeah, we are working on putting together an API and we are planning in our next release of DSID, which will be DSID 5. We're hoping to have that be this calendar year uh, and it will include an API on the site. Okay, great. Any other questions? Um, I don't see, I don't think I see anything else in the chat. Going once, going twice. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much, Karen, for joining us today and, and for your wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. So now I'd like to welcome our last speaker, um, Dr. Lila Saldana. Dr. Saldana is currently a freelance professional specializing in the science, labeling, and communication of dietary supplements and foods. Uh, until recently, she was a senior nutrition scientist with ODS serving as a subject matter expert for the Dietary Supplement Label Database and the Dietary Supplement Ingredient Database. Uh, Dr. Saldana facilitated the development of analytical methods through ODS's Analytical Methods and Reference Materials Program. Uh, she co-edited nine issues of the Annual Bibliography of Significant Advances in Dietary Supplement Research 
And she also led a cross-agency federal effort to define and develop approaches for assessing the health effects of bioactive food components, the development of vitamin, mineral, and nutrient biomarker and analytical methodology workshops, and scientific sessions at professional and dietary supplement trade conferences. So today, Dr. Saldana will be presenting finding information on dietary supplement products. So please welcome Dr. Saldana. Thank you. Okay, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Leela Saldana, and the title of my talk is Finding Information on Dietary Supplement Products. The problem why this is not advancing. Okay, got you. All right. The first two is always tricky, isn't it? Uh, so this presentation reflects my viewpoints and knowledge about the topic. Any use of product names and product labels in this presentation is for descriptive purposes only and does not imply an endorsement or recommendation of these products. So my talk, as been mentioned earlier, is will focus on the dietary supplement label database and how the labeling regulations affect the information listed in the DSLD and the features of the DSLD. So the DSLD is a congressionally mandated project. In 2004, Congress asked the office to quote, develop, create, regularly update, maintain, and make available to government and research entities a database of all supplement labels sold in the US. The DSLD public website was launched in 2013 and has since gone through a series of design and functional upgrades. In 2017, thanks to the encouragement from a member of Congress, we developed and launched a mobile-friendly version of the DSLD. In 2021, which was last year, the DSLD was redesigned and launched after 18 months of development work. Currently, there are over 140,000 product labels in the database, which Joyce just mentioned to you. Since the labels entered in the database are kept in the database, this number includes labels of products entered on market and historic labels, that is those entered on and after 2011. Our goal is to make the DSLD a source of supplement label information for researchers and users interested in wanting information about these products, which is why we keep labels in the database even after the products are discontinued or reformulated or the labels are revised to follow new labeling regulations. We move these labels to the off-market category in the database. So these are the sections of my talk. Since dietary supplements are regulated as foods, it is first important to understand how supplement labels differ from food labels and how this affects the information in the DSLD. Then I have a few slides to show how to navigate and what to expect in the DSLD. And finally, the use of conversion factors as it relates to labeling. So you have heard about you know, the regulations governing dietary supplements, but I will be talking about them in the context of trying to appreciate the information in the DSLD since, since the label information in the DSLD is derived from product labels. So what information can you expect in the DSLD? As Joyce has said, it includes product labels, labels labeled as dietary supplements. It captures all the information printed on the labels, all ingredient information as listed within the supplement facts our panel, our all claims, information on the brand, and an image of the product label. And you can search for any of this information in the DSLD. It is important to keep in mind that the NIH and the ODS are not regulatory ag agencies, so we do not verify this information, so, sorry, or check for conformance with regulation 
before it is entered in the database. So those of you who are familiar with food labeling will recognize that this is not the current label for Caltrain. Uh, rather than replace this label with the current label, I thought I would use this label as a teaching moment. So one quick way, and if you ever go to the grocery store and look at the uh, label uh, to tell whether this is an old or a revised label, is to look at the units used to express, to express the amounts of the fat-soluble vitamins if it is listed. On this label, the amounts are in IU. The new units are in micrograms. The food labeling regulations, which became final in 2016, require that the amounts of fat-soluble vitamins be listed in micrograms. I will address conversion factors in labeling at the end of my talk. So what are the similarities and differences in labeling from conventional foods? Like foods, there is no mandatory product registration requirements or product in, or the requirement to provide product information to the FDA, i.e. product uh, mandatory product listing. Thus, which is very important, there is no official record of dietary supplement products marketed in the U.S. However, there are many differences, and these differences are outlined in the Dietary Supplement Health Education Act of 1994. So some of the key features of dietary supplements resulting from DSHEA, and I'm only going to focus on two. Uh, first, DSHEA created a new regulatory category of products called dietary supplements. And more importantly, and to appreciate the difference between food and dietary supplement product labels, and to appreciate the information in the DSLD, DSHEA also created a new category of ingredients called dietary ingredients. And it's really very important to understand this concept of dietary ingredients. If you do, then you really have, in my opinion, know the difference between foods and dietary supplements. And within this category, six classes of dietary ingredients which can be listed within the supplement facts box. These dietary ing ingredients can be in group grouped into those with daily values and those without daily values. So for labeling purposes, daily values are reference amounts of nutrients to consume or not to exceed each day. So there are six categories of dietary ingredients, and you've heard about this list many times today that can be listed within the supplement facts box. But I don't know if this one point really registered with you, but there are only 35 of these dietary ingredients that have daily values. Vitamins and minerals highlighted in this slide in green have daily values. The third and fourth class highlighted in the, in the slide in yellow, some have daily values. And in the DSLD, when we classified labels by product type, we included protein with amino acids. In the original definition of a dietary supplement, protein was not included with amino acids. And we included in the fourth class all other nutrients, such as fiber, fat, and carbohydrates that are not listed in the first three classes. So that's the way we classify ingredients in the DSLD. So some of these nutrients have DVs, but not all. And this is important to know. And there are there is a DV for protein, but there are no DVs for the individual amino acids. There are DVs for fats, but not all fatty acids. The fifth and sixth class of dietary ingredients, which are herbs and botanicals, and, and then concentrate, metabolite, constituent, extract, or isolate, do not have daily values. To simplify the classification of ingredients in the DSLD, 
we included all ingredients that cannot be classified in the first five classes in the sixth class. And in short, we call this the non-botanical and non-nutrient. So keep in mind the first four categories listed in this slide are all nutrients. And then we have the botanical, which is the fifth. And then the sixth is anything that's not a botanical and not a nutrient. If a dietary ingredient has a daily value, it can be listed within the supplement facts, but not, with, but not within the nutrition facts box. However, if a dietary ingredient does not have a daily value, uh, it cannot be listed within the nutrition facts box. And a good example of this is DHA as shown in this slide. DHA currently cannot be listed within the nutrition facts box because it does not have a daily value. Another example is caffeine. A third point I wanted to make, which is this distinction between dietary ingredients with and without daily values, is that um, you can make structural function claim for any dietary ingredient that is listed within the supplement facts box. And hence you see this plethora of claims printed on supplement labels, not found on food labels. And as you can see on this slide, you can make a structure function claim for DHA, but you cannot make this on a food label as it does not have a daily value. Now, I think Joe mentioned in his presentation you can make nutrient claims stating well accepted functions for nutrients on food labels. You know, things that everybody, a little kid is taught, you know, go drink your milk because it's got calcium to build strong bones and it's a well accepted function. And therefore, a disclaimer is not needed on a food label like the disclaimer shown on this slide here. Sorry, my point is not working too well. So I'm sure you've read many of these nutrient function claims on cereal boxes. I worked with the Kellogg company for more than 10 years, and I helped write and substantiate many of these claims. The DSLD captures all these claims, and we get this question often, but they are not categorized as there is no official categorization scheme for these types of claims. Another important difference between ingredients with and without daily values, and Joe Betts did mention this in his presentation, is you can list dietary ingredients without daily values in proprietary blends, but you cannot list ingredients with daily values in proprietary blends. So for those of you who are familiar with the regulation, these are the B2 ingredients, as they're described in the B2 section of the regulations. Those without daily values are the B3 ingredients as they're described in the B3 section of the regulation. So what is the difference between a blend and a proprietary blend? With a proprietary blend, the manufacturer does not have to declare the amount of each component within the blend the label to your right, only the amount of the blend must be declared. This contrasts with the label to your left, where the amount of the blend and each individual ingredient is declared. With proprietary blends, the amount of each dietary ingredient within the blend must be listed in descending order by weight. So this is a close up of that label I showed you in my earlier slide uh, to the right of a proprietary blend where you can see the total amount of the blend is declared. There is a list of the ingredients in declining order of predominance, but the weight of each of those ingredients is not provided on the label or declared on the label. So this is important when you see the DSLD, this is not because the NIH is sloppy, and this is important to keep in mind. So if you see missing values in the DSLD as shown in this example for caffeine, it is because the manufacturer has chosen to de 
declared caffeine as a proprietary blend and not print the amount of caffeine on the label. Remember, the DSLD is information derived from information printed on labels. So for many bioactives of interest to researchers, depending on the bioactive, between 20 to 70% of labels may not list the amount of these ingredients. So what are the implications for researchers and practitioners? A researcher may be unable to estimate population intakes and exposure amounts for in ingredients of public health interest, example, caffeine. Practitioners may be unable to determine dosage and interaction with other foods or drugs if the amounts of ingredients are not declared on the label. So in my next set of slides, finally, I will show you the features of the DSLD. On this slide is a snapshot of the home page. As you can see on this slide, the number of labels in the database is prominently displayed. As, and if you worked with the previous site, um, this, this is a new feature of the database that was launched last year. You can navigate the da database using the tabs in the menu bar above. If you scroll down, you will find other information about the database and information on new features and updates. You can start your search from this page. I prefer to go to the search page. We can get here. All right. Um, on the search page is an example for a search for iron. So when you enter iron in the search bar, it will search for iron that is printed anywhere on the label. Um, but you can narrow your search using the filters in the left-hand column. And if you recognize this, we did try to mimic PubMed. It's the, this left-hand uh, filter column is similar to the column you would see in PubMed. So as you can see here, the first thing I did was I narrowed the search to products on market. I further narrowed the search to products entered between 2018 and 2020. I further selected the target group pregnant and lactating women because I was only interested in prenatal supplements. And then I further narrowed the search by product type and did not include all the product types that prenatal supplements come in. And, um, and this resulted in 64 labels in the database. So you can then download the search and the DSLD gives you a variety of options for downloading your search result. Um, if you're a researcher, you can get it in an Excel format, a comma-separated file format, or a JSON file format. And you can, once you click on this button, it will take you to another page, which will also give you options on, you know, how much information you really want, so you can choose what information you want. So on this page is uh, the, the browse ingredients page. And this page has been changed in the updated database. So when you go to this browse ingredient data uh, page and you search for an ingredient, um, unlike the old site where it took you and gave you a list of products, um, here, and I'll show you shortly, um, it does not do that. And um, what it does is when you go to the next, what it takes you to. And this is some of the information that Joyce just shared with you, but a different way of finding it um, through the, to the DSLD site. So staying with iron and clicking with iron, this, this information actually was in the old database, but it was buried in the database. And we thought this was important information that people would li like to know. And it's a good way and a good starting point to help you with your research. So many of the things that Joyce talked about in her presentation, the fact sheets, the PubMed searches, here's another way to get to it if you're you know, 
by looking at the but searching for the ingredient. Um, so under the resources page, um, you'll find also other useful information. Um, I did want to um, bring your attention to the release history button. Uh, so in on the release history, you will get a history of when the database was updated. And so the newest release was actually just two weeks ago. Prior to that, if you had searched the database, you would have got 136,000 labels. So the release history will give you a history of, you know, what the updates have been, what the updates to the database. So moving to the, my last kind of last two slides on the use of conversion factors as it relates to dietary supplement label databases, as it relates to su dietary supplement labels, sorry. As you can see from this slide, that the units used for expressing the amount of nutrients on labels has changed, and especially for the fat-soluble vitamins. So they have gone from IUs to micrograms, and folate has gone from micrograms to dietary folate equivalents. So my intent with this slide is not to tell you what conversion factors to use, but to make an important point about your choice of conversion factors. So using folate in this uh, as an example, I want to sh show you that depending on which conversion factor you use, you can get different answers. So the unit for expressing folate is, as I said, is now is dietary folate equivalents. And the Food and Nutrition Board and their reference intake publication for B vitamins gives two formulas for converting folic acid amounts to dietary, to DFEs either multiplying by 1.7, or if the product is consumed with food, you divide by 0.6, and if it is taken on an empty stomach, you divide by 0.5. So you can get very different answers depending on which formula you use to convert the 800 micrograms of folic acid, which is a typical amount found in prenatal supplements, to, to, to the uh, new amounts at, declared as dietary folate equivalents. So for labeling purposes, um, the FDA has a guidance document, and it's a really excellent guidance document that I encourage you to see, which where they not only give you the conversion factor to use. And in this case, the FDA has selected 1.7, but they also walk you through how to do the calculations. So if, if it's for labeling purposes, you know, please use the FDA guidance documents. If it is for research purposes, you know, use whichever conversion factor that is common for that publication, but cite or reference what what you use and why you used it. So my takeaways from this talk that I want you to remember are, one, dietary supplements are foods. Dishay created a new class of ingredients called dietary ingredients. Since the DSLD contains information um, printed on labels, this affects what is in the DSLD. Regarding dietary ingredients, most do not have daily values. You can make statements of nutritional support for any dietary ingredient declared within the supplement facts box. And you can declare dietary ingredients that do not have daily values as proprietary blends. So that how does this then impact the DSLD? If, if an ingredient is listed within a proprietary blend, you will find blank amounts in the DSLD. And um, we do not categorize the claims 
based on, uh, sorry, we do not categorize products based on the uh, intended use because there is no categorization scheme for claims. And this is very important because we keep getting asked, you know, is there a search for intended use? And there is no search for intended use. So thank you for listening. And I have one last shameless slide. Oh, sorry. Uh, if you are uh, registered to attend Nutrition 2022, I encourage you to listen to our session on proprietary blends. We have two excellent pan panelists at the session that will provide you with the regulatory and industry perspective on blends. So thank you very much. And I'm going to stop sharing. And I'll be back to Great. Thank you very much, Leela. That was a really interesting uh, talk about a very useful database. Um, and I think we do have some questions coming in. Many thanks for the presentation. Um, and again, any uh, attendees uh, that have additional questions, please add them to the chat. Um, so to start off, there was a question from Monday that pertained to the DSLD. So mm -hmm. I'll ask that now. Um, is there any way of tying the DSLD with companies that submit their structure function claims for products with the FDA? Any way of making both of these websites more robust and user friendly? I would think that would be up to the FDA to do because our site is a public site and they can download it and use it. And we have several researchers. I noted one who's on, I think, participating in the vision who uses our database. So that would be up to FDA. You know, the, we don't have access to, you know, to the site. So that would be up to the FDA. I don't think we could do that. For, for one is we are not a regulatory agency, you know, so we couldn't really do that unless we got a congressional mandate. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, and is it possible to submit products for inclusion in the DSLD and what's that process? Yes, very much so. If you go to the DSLD website under the resources tab, you on, I think it's the information is provided under the frequently answered questions on how to submit labels. Okay, great. Um, uh, there was a comment, interesting point about proprietary blends not having quantitative amounts. Uh, that would suggest that the blend could have many combinations of individual constituents, which which could affect the efficacy of the supplement. Um, any comments on that? You know, it's, it's really kind of hiding that information. Any additional comments on that? Um, I would suggest, you know, we published a paper recently in the Journal of Nutrition on proprietary blends because proprietary blends are of great interest because they appear a lot on weight loss uh, supplement products and they appear a lot in energy products and so there's a lot of interest in them and yes you can I think the point I tried to make in my presentation is that only those dietary ingredients without with DVs cannot be listed in proprietary blends but virtually all other ingredients can be listed so you know all the hundreds of thousands you could have a blend with any number of ingredients where you don't know the amounts and you also don't know what, I think the point this person was making, you know, what is the interaction of those ingredients within the blend, but also the interaction of those ingredients with other ingredients in the product, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. Um, and, and while you, you mentioned DVs, you know, that they are the values listed on product labels, a lot of people get confused between the DVs and how they relate to the RDAs. Yes. Can you talk a little bit more about how they're set and how they relate to the RDAs? So the FDA, because you're selecting one set of values, the difference between the recommended dietary allowances, which come out from the Food and Nutrition Board and the Institute of Medicine, they set values by age and gender group. So you have, let's say for iron, you'll have a lot of values within, within, a, within an age range. So what the FDA does for labeling purposes, which is um, is to select the, that highest number 
within that range for labeling purposes. So for labeling purposes, there are only four categories. So for four and above, they select the value, the RDA value, the highest value of all the RDAs for that for four and above. So labeling is intended to help with comparing one product and with another. It's not intended to provide you with information about what your, your nutrient needs are, which is what right. the purpose of the RD is. Although in many cases, as you noted, the DV does match or you know, it's, it's very close to the adult RDA, but exactly, yeah, they're, they're, they're not exactly the same yes, thing. So and a good example is, is, of course, iron, where the value for an adult woman is so much higher than an adult male. So that's not representing the DV for iron does not represent the recommend the need for an adult male. It's more designed to represent the need of an adult woman. So that, that's how the DV is set. Great. OK, so can you go into a little more detail about the coding? For the dietary supplement label database so that we understand a little bit more about how it works and how that coding affects what's presented in the database. Right. Uh, yeah, I think that's an important point, Carol, uh, which I didn't sort of go into great depth in my talk, which is researchers really need to understand two things. Uh, one is how is the information in the database collected and obtained? And Joyce and her talk mentioned OWL, which is also a label database, and the DSLD, which is also a label database. But the process for acquiring labels for each of these databases is not the same. So OWL has their method for collecting labels, and DSLD has their method for collecting labels. And also, once that information is collected, the question is, how are they how does how are the how is it how the entry is defined and coded? That's also important. Uh, Karen, for example, mentioned in a talk about you know something as simple as a multivitamin and mineral. You know how it is defined and coded in the DSLD may not be the same as how it is defined and coded right now in the DSID or in NHANES. So when you're starting to compare data, even though you quote unquote, comparing vitamins and minerals, you may not be actually co comparing the products as defined in the database. Um, another example also within with the DSLD, because the FD NIH is not a regulatory agency, we don't always code things consistent with the regulation. And a good example is proprietary blends, since there's a lot of interest in proprietary blends. Uh, proprietary blends in the DSLD is not coded the way it is defined in the regulation. So in the DSLD, uh, it, what is coded as a proprietary blend is if the blend name uses the name proprietary blend, or there is a symbol used in association with the name, not if as the, per the definition, only the total amount of the blend is provided but not the weight of the individual ingredients within the blend. So there's a big difference in the coding between the definition and the DSLD. So researchers, before they use the, the data for analysis, they should really ask or determine how is the entry defined and coded? Yeah, very good, very good points that you're making there. Very important to understand that so you know what you're working with. And, and uh, on, on that comment about, or the, the thought about um, researchers using the data, um, similar to the uh, question we had for Karen, um, is there an API for the DSLD yes. that researchers can use and how, how do they go about that? Do they have to contact us? Is it available? How does that work? It, you can download it directly from the website and there is a whole page dedicated to how you can download the entire database. Okay, terrific. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat. Anyone else? Again, going once, going twice. Any other comments? Um, if you think of anything else, you can certainly add it uh, in the future, but uh, that looks like it. So um, thank you very much, Dr. Saldana. Um, great talk. And
And thank you to everyone who attended this breakout session. I, I think it really helped to you know, identify and, and describe a lot of useful resources. Um, and hopefully you've you walked away with it, uh, away from it with some, some additional you know, tools in your toolbox. Um, so that closes our session for today, um, and we will look forward to seeing you all tomorrow morning at 11.30 or 11 a.m. Eastern time. So thank you. Thank you.